For self-employed borrowers, writing off too much on your tax returns always comes back to bite you when you're trying to buy a house. So if you're a veteran, you've served our country, or your spouse has served our country, you could buy a million dollar house. Good morning, everyone. Uh, just wanted to first take the opportunity to say thanks for meeting with us today virtually. Nice to meet all of you guys. So uh, Alex and I have probably known each other I don't know, maybe seven years, something like that, I would guess, uh, in, in that ballpark. Um, we've had a business relationship for a while now. And, uh, you know, he always calls me with questions on, you know, mortgages and opportunities and things of that nature. So uh, obviously purchasing a home is a way to build wealth. Uh, and obviously the more wealth that you build, uh, the better it is for you. Uh, not only today, but also in the long run. So what we wanted to do is kind of put together a quick guide of, um, you know, buying a home, whether it's your first home or whether it's your fifth home, um, you know, what goes into mortgages and, um, you know, what needs to, to happen from, from our side. Uh, Sean and I have been partners now for, um, I don't know, we've worked together for probably about five years now. Um, years ago. Yep. And um, about three years ago, we decided to open up our own brokerage. Um, and this is what we do. Uh, we meet with clients and realtors uh, like yourselves. We educate them in regards to uh, mortgage types, products, programs, and kind of get you understanding um, mortgage uh, 101. Uh, it's obviously not going to be every crevice of the mortgage business, but it will allow you to have a really firm understanding of uh, what it takes to buy a home and then what it takes from a different product st standpoint. Uh, we're also going to go over the benefits of using a mortgage bro brokerage versus a bank. Uh, we're going to talk about how interest rates are determined and then a lot of common mistakes that uh, people make from a standpoint of buying, whether again, it's your first home or your fifth home. Uh, the thing about the home buying process is, you know, I, I kind of say it's almost like saying, hey, I want to wait to have that first baby, right? There's never going to be the perfect time. So when's the perfect time? It's going to be today. Um, and again, it doesn't mean that you go out and write a contract on a home today, but you start the process. So sometimes that process might be six months down the road. Sometimes that process might take you a year or two years to even be ready in order to do that. Uh, so with that being said, I'll let Sean take over the presentation and then I'll be back with you in a minute. Hey everybody. So as Jason said, we're gonna essentially start with a timeline from you getting the idea of wanting to buy a home, kind of weighing the options of renting versus buying, all the way through to getting the keys in your hand, closing and moving. So what I always like to say is you want to start with a vehicle and you're going to fill this vehicle with real estate professionals that are going to guide you to your closing. You're very fortunate that you have Michelle. She's going to be able to help out. So we're always going to say start with a strategic partner in a realtor. So we're going to head over to step one. We're going to pick up Michelle. You guys are going to have a small conversation basically going over which areas you like, if you're thinking more about a single family house versus a condo and getting an idea of what price points are in which parts of the city. You got that basic information. It's not time to go start looking at houses yet because you got to see what you can afford, what kind of monthly payment you're comfortable with. Uh, we had to see it all the time where people qualify for a lot bigger house than what they're actually looking for. So it's not just about the price point, it's also you know, if you're used to spending $2,000 a month on rent, you don't want to jump that up to 3000 all of a sudden. So knowing what your monthly payment is, what the price points are, that's going to come in step two when you talk to a mortgage broker like myself or Jason. What we're going to do is we're going to look at your income, your credit, your assets. We're going to review your documents. We're going to do that up front before you ever look at a house. That way, when you start looking and you want to put an offer on, you're confident that you're going to get approved. So I'm going to stay light on the financing because the majority of the rest of the presentation kind of goes over this step. So we're going to move on. The main thing about the financing at this point is that you got a pre-approval letter 
for a certain loan amount at a certain dollar figure. So we're going to cruise on down, spin around, and Michelle's going to start showing you some properties. This might take a week, this might take a month, it might take longer. It really depends on how picky you are with the house at a certain point, but uh, it's a long-term investment, so it's not something to rush into, and doing your due diligence is always key. But once you find that property that you love, you adore it, uh, you'd be heartbroken if you didn't get it, that's when it's time to start negotiating and putting an offer together. So you're gonna work with your realtor to figure out how much you wanna offer. Are you gonna have, are you gonna offer what they're asking? Are you gonna ask for a seller credit so they can cover some of your closing costs? Or are you super hungry for this house and maybe you're willing to put a couple thousand over asking just to make your offer stronger? If all goes well, the seller agrees to what your contract says or has some adjustments that you can agree to. It's amazing. You go under contract. At this point, you haven't bought the house yet, but you have an intent to. And we call this the protection step because this is the time in the due diligence period where you can look at the house, get a better uh, understanding of it. You know, at showings, they're quick, you're in, you're out. This is your time to go back, hire a home inspector to go through it, just like you would if you were buying a car and you had a mechanic look at the car you wanna buy. The home inspector does the same thing. Now there's three inspections that you're gonna to wanna to get done. The first is the standard home inspection, which goes through the nuts and bolts of the house, gives you a report, and essentially you can use that report in a negotiation tactic. You know, you love the house, but you know, maybe the driveway's cracked and needs replacing. The lender might not care about that, but it might be something you care about. So maybe you ask for a discount there. Other things such as like broken windows or like major roof damage, those are items that are gonna need to be taken care of because the lender needs to be sure that they're lending on a house that's nice and livable. The other way to protect yourself is through the appraisal. So that's when an independent appraiser comes out, values the home. Let me skirt back to the, <laughs> the other two inspections. You got the four point inspection, that is your electrical, plumbing, HVAC, and roof. The reason you want to get the four point is because that can get you a discount on your homeowner's insurance. And then the other one is the wind mitigation. And that's a more in-depth roof analysis. With the four point and the wind mitigation, you can supply those to the insurance company you're working with and hopefully get a discount on your insurance. During the protection time, you're going to solidify which insurance company you're going to go for and you're going to get evidence of insurance because up until this point when we're doing the pre-approval um, unless we have a specific house in mind that you can get an insurance quote on we're having a little bit of an estimate at that time so it's always good to get the insurance uh, quote in and ready as early as possible that way we can finalize the numbers so if all goes well the appraisal comes back at value the inspection report is great. We do our final approval. So at the very beginning, before you started looking at houses, we reviewed your documents. We looked at your income, we looked at your assets, we reviewed your credit. But there's certain things that can't be done until you're under contract and under the way. One of those is the appraisal. The other is reviewing the insurance you shop for. Generally, insurance agents aren't gonna write a policy that they know a lender is not gonna accept but it still gets reviewed. This is the fun part, guys. You're closing on your home, your all-star team gets to leave, and you get to move into your new house. The 30 days typically from contract to closing can be stressful, but what we try to do is to get you as prepared as possible before that starts. That way everything flows nice and smoothly. But let's get a little more in depth on what goes into your mortgage and getting approved for one. There's three main pillars. You have your credit. Now that's your credit score as well as the expenses that are on your credit report because those are the ones that we're gonna look at for your income and expenses. But the next pillar is your assets. There's closing costs, there's down payments, there's things you pay for outside of closing. So the lender verifies that you have enough money on hand to pay for the transaction. Assets is Pretty straightforward compared to the other two. 
And finally, you have your income and expenses. So let's dig into the first one, your credit score. There's three credit bureaus that we get scores from. So they're all a little different. I like to compare them to Coke and Pepsi. We're both making cola, but their recipes are a little different. That's the same with the credit bureaus. That's why like, if you're looking at one and you have a chance to look at two different scores, they're rarely the exact same. One's a couple points higher. One might have you at 720. The other might have you at 690. So what do we do to combat that? Lenders use your middle score. We drop the lowest, we drop the highest, we take your middle score. And that's what the software that runs the approval uses uh, when it comes to pricing out your interest rate, that middle score is what's used. But Sean, what if there's two borrowers? What happens then? We look at the middle score of the lower borrower. So when you're thinking about purchasing a home with somebody, keep that in mind. You might have a great credit, but that doesn't necessarily mean they do. And what goes into your credit score? The two biggest components of what your credit score is, is your payment history. So making your payments on time is key. One 15 day late on your credit report kills the score for a while. And then the other piece is how much credit you have available to how much you're using. Um, so there's two simple ways to combat this. One, spend less on your credit card. Or two, something that's generally overlooked is asking for an increase on your credit line. Let's say, for example, you have a credit card, you only have one credit card, its limit is $1,000. And each month, you're not spending a whole lot, maybe you have $500 on it. Well, to the bank and the lender, it's looking like you're using 50% of your available credit. So one simple way to combat that is to reach out to the credit card company and say, hey, I'd like to increase my limit. Say they increase it to 2,000. Now, instead of at the end of the month, you having a 50% usage ratio, you're down to a 25% usage ratio. General rule of thumb is using less than 30%, of your available credit each month is gonna slowly raise your score 30 to 50%, it's gonna stay kind of flat. And if you're using over 50% of your available credit each month, you're gonna see that score start to tick down month after month. And the next biggest component, 15%, is types of credit. So you have some credit cards, maybe you have some student loans and a car payment. Adding a mortgage onto that is a different type of credit. So in the long run, having a mortgage will actually increase your credit as well. And then the next component is new credit. So lenders get worried when somebody opens three credit cards at the same time, right? That usually means they're in a situation where they need to borrow money quickly. Same with inquiries. So one of the benefits of working with a broker is we pull your credit once and then shop you with you know, dozens of lenders. If you were to go out on your own and have each one of those lenders pull your credit, as long as you do it in a certain time window, everybody kind of looks at it as one inquiry. But say that gets spread out over a month or two, because, you know, trying to get a dozen quotes from different lenders is going to take a while, then it could start to affect it. And the smallest component is your credit history length. And I always say, you have that old credit card that you never use. Um, you're thinking about closing it. Well, the length of it being open is helping your credit. So if there's not a huge annual fee, it's not too much work for you to keep it open. I would say always, always keep it open if you can. So we got the first pillar knocked out, your credit score. What's next? Assets. Now we have different types of assets. Not all assets are created equal. The best assets are the ones that are liquid and on hand. So the money you have in your checking and savings, that's generally where the money for the down payment and closing costs are going into, into the transaction. However, there's still other ways to get your assets. I say gift funds are okay because not everybody is granted the opportunity to have a family member or a friend that's just going to gift them thousands of dollars towards the home purchase. Another way to tap into assets is your retirement accounts. If you have. 401k plans generally have an option to 
essentially to borrow against your 401k. The neat thing about this is the interest you pay, you're paying into your own 401k. So you're not paying a bank to borrow money, you're paying yourself to borrow money. And a lot of times they also allow for up to, I believe, 10% withdrawal uh, without penalty. So there's always some options there. Investments, you know, if you have a stock portfolio or crypto, they're good assets. The only issue is in order to use them, you need to liquidate them. You need to sell them, turn it into cash. So if it's your dream home, it's time to do it. Maybe that makes sense. Generally, you kind of want to leave the assets you have put towards something else where they belong. You can get a seller credit. You can get a lender credit to help out. You know, you have good credit, you have good income. Maybe you're a few thousand dollars short of where you need to be on the asset side. Why they're okay and not good is when you're asking for a seller credit, it's making your offer less competitive to the competition. If the other buyer down the road is saying, hey, Mr. Seller, I'll pay you full price for your house. And we come along and say, hey, Mr. Seller, we'll pay you full price, but we want a $5,000 seller concession. It makes the offer less attractive. It depends on the type of market we're in. It's definitely becoming more of a buyer's game. So I feel like seller credits are something that we're going to see a return of. Uh, for the last couple of years, sellers got to do what they wanted to do. There was a dozen buyers putting offers on their houses the first day. That's slowing up. There's a little less competition out there, which is good for the people that are looking to buy now. And another great way to get assets that you might not have is through a down payment assistance program. Why this is a good option and not, or an okay option and not a great option or a good option is these programs generally come at a cost of a higher interest rate and they're a tighter box to fit into. A lot of times there's income limits, uh, loan limits. It's hard to fit into the box, but we always explore that option if it's something that you're looking to do. And bad assets, cash on hand and large deposits. So what banks do, lenders do, is we always review two months of your assets. So if there's a couple of large deposits and what's considered a large deposit is anything over 50% of your income, they're gonna review. I always say the easiest way to avoid any headaches with that is to deposit the cash you have on hand now. Again, I already said it, two months of bank statements are reviewed. So if you put the money in three months ago, what's reviewed doesn't have any large deposits on it, no explanation needed. It can get complicated a lot of times, you know, cash tips, proving that you got cash tips, it's a process. So if that can be avoided, that's the best way to go about it. What are your assets used for? So there's three main categories that your assets are going to be used. After you go under contract, but before closing, there's a few out-of-pocket expenses you have towards the transaction at closing, and then if the loan requires it, reserves. But let's start at the top and go down from there. You found the house you want, you go under contract, you're gonna to have to put an initial deposit down. Um, what that deposit is, again, it's a negotiation. You can put a little, you can put a lot. It's generally due within three days of the contract being signed. Again, now we're on to the protectors, your home inspection and your appraisal. These are things that you pay for when they happen and not a closing. You generally have a 10 to 15 day inspection period. That's your get out of jail free card. For whatever reason, you get cold feet, you don't wanna buy the house, you found another one that you're in love with. Those 10 to 15 days, you can cancel the contract and really have to not explain why. After that, there needs to be a good reason. We order the appraisal usually within the first one to two days of the contract but the contract usually allows for 20 to 30 days for that to come back and then if you happen to be buying a condo or in a community that has an hoa you may need to get uh, either documents for the lender to review or an application fee for the hoa so that takes care of your out-of-pocket expenses towards the transaction so what's left so at closing it's a couple of days before you're like Sean, how much money do I need to send to the title company? Quite simple. We take your down payment. 
we take your closing costs and Jason's going to go through the closing costs a little later because I know that's always a good piece of information to see what the other costs are to a mortgage other than the down payment. So we take your down payment, your closing costs, we subtract that initial deposit that you put down and then what's left is your cash to close. So that's the amount of money you need the day of closing to get the keys to the house. And then certain loan programs require reserves. And reserves is just money that you have on top of your down payment and closing costs. So that money never leaves your account. The lender's just verifying that it exists. And how it works is the lender will say you need three months of reserves or six months of reserves. So we take your new mortgage payment, your principal and interest, taxes and insurance. If there's an HOA, we add all that up. Say it's $2,000 a month, you got three months, you need $6,000 in reserves. So that's how assets work. And then the third pillar, we have our income and expenses. There's all types of income, some's better than others. The easiest income to qualify for is a salary position because it's very easy to determine what you're gonna make month to month. Same with a consistent hourly W-2 position. Those are the best, they're the easiest, they're the most straightforward to approve. Does that mean you're any less likely to get approved with the other incomes? No, not at all. But there's a little more to it. So variable income. What happens is instead of taking what you made in the last 30 days and assuming that's what you make every month, what happens is we do an averaging. So we're generally gonna look at the two year history is what, as well as what you made year to date and average that over the two years. That can be beneficial, that can be, that can be worse for other people. Say your commission started going up over the past couple of years. Last year was a really good year, but the year before that wasn't so much. Well, we're averaging. That's why it's always good to, to work with your lender as soon as you can, because I'm turning off my, my mortgage professional brain here. What we think we make versus what the bank or the lender calculates that you make are generally a little different. So we wanna get that determined early on because that's gonna go into how much home you can qualify for and you know that's an important thing. Other income that some people don't think about, you have rental income. So maybe you're buying a two unit and gonna live in one. That other unit that you're renting out can be used as income. Something that's less common, but still possible in certain circumstances is border income. And that's when somebody's actually gonna live in your condo or your single family home. Generally, you need to have a history of them doing that. So it's not just saying, hey, my friend Joey's gonna come live with me. It's me and Joey have been living together for two years and I have you know rent paid to me from him verifying that. So that's a little less likely, but it's definitely an option. Um, if you're receiving child support or alimony and have more than three years left, it's considered income and self-employed, still good, but we do a two year history. So if you had really good last year, we're likely gonna have to average it out over two years. So again, what we think we make versus what's calculated to what you make is usually different. And now we're into the bad income. Cash tips not reported, always hard to verify. So it's always it's always best if you know all the income is going on to the payroll system. We get to use the most of it. Common misconception is hey, I'm just gonna start a new, I'm gonna start Ubering, I'm gonna start a second job uh, to raise my income. That's great if you're committed because you need to have it for two years. If you have a second job for less than two years, they're generally not going to count that second employment's income. You can still have it, it's still great to have, but when it comes to qualifying for a loan, it's not going to count towards it. I've gotten this question more times than I care to admit. Sean, can I use my unemployment income? No, it's likely ended. You're back to work. So though you were getting $600 for the past, you know, six months it's not going to continue moving forward so we can't use it and then at the end you know anything that's non-continuing so great aunt sally 
you know, passed away and you got a $10,000 check from the estate. That's awesome for last year, but that's not going to happen moving forward. So we're not going to count that income. So that's the income side. Now we got the expenses. There's different types of expenses as well. And this is expenses that are going to go into calculating your debt to income ratio. If you have any current houses, we're going to look at the mortgages, the taxes and insurance, uh, installment loans like car loans. Your credit card is interesting. We're looking at what the minimum payment is each month. So the balance isn't really as important. Obviously, a bigger balance is going to have a bigger minimum credit score or I mean a bigger minimum payment, but at the end of the day, we're looking at the minimum payments. Student loans, even if they're deferred, we have to calculate some form of payment. Uh, again, child support, alimony can work both ways. To somebody it's income, to somebody an, it's an expense. Uh, if you have more than three years of it left, that's gonna get counted against you. And of course you have your new home expenses. So you're gonna have this new mortgage, you're going to have taxes, you're going to have insurance, you might have an HOA payment. That's all going to get calculated. Expenses not used. So the utilities that you're paying now, not going to count them against them. Bills like your phone bill or health insurance or anything like that, that's going to typically get paid either in full via your bank account or it's going on to one of your credit cards and that's where the payment's getting calculated. Don't put your Netflix in the expenses. No OnlyFans. Um, I did a loan for an OnlyFans person a couple of years ago, and it is appalling how much money they make. Um, <laughs> but those are the expenses that go into your debt to income ratio. So the debt to income is very important. Typically, lenders allow you to have a 50% debt to income ratio. So if you make $6,000, $3,000 of that can go towards expenses. So you can see if you have an expensive car payment, a lot of student loans, a lot of credit cards, that $3,000 gets eaten up by all these things that aren't housing related. So what's left is what you can use towards your monthly mortgage payment. So that a lot of times determines how big of a loan you can get, how big of a purchase price you can get is Hey, Sean, you know, at the end of the day, we have $1,900 to go towards a housing payment. You know, how big of a loan does that get you? And that's kind of your upper limit. And that's what you need to go out and say, you know, I can get a house in this price range. Let's start looking. So we got through the three pillars. You got your assets, your credit, and your income and expenses. Those are the three main things that go into determining how much you're going to qualify for, what type of loan you're going to qualify for. And ultimately, that is the grand picture of getting a mortgage. If we have some time, what I'd like to do is do a quick like pen and paper on a whiteboard so you guys can see it, work through of income and the expenses. I'm going to, I think we're going to have time, but I'll, I'll save that to the end because I want to get through the rest of it. So I'm going to let Jason jump back in. We've gone through, you got an idea of the timeline of the loan process. You have a good idea of what goes into a mortgage. Now we're going to look at the different programs out there and you will kind of start to see, you know, they all have advantages and they all have disadvantages. So it's not like a one, this is the best loan program for everybody. Certain ones are better for certain people and that's why it's great to work with somebody like Jason and myself who can really walk you through the pros and cons of each loan program. So Jason, I'll let you hop back in. Hey everybody, just kind of going to run through these loan programs with you. So first one I want to talk about conventional loans and that's probably one of the most common mortgage products out there. So with conventional loans, you might hear the determination of or the, the words Fannie and Freddie. So Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, those are the two big investors that actually handle government uh, loans. Now, just because your loan is a certain type doesn't mean that you'll get a mortgage statement from Fannie Mae. You'll actually get a mortgage statement from a servicer that's actually billing you out. So let's just call that bank one, two, three is sending you up your mortgage statement monthly. They're the ones servicing the loan for Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac. 
So conventional loans do allow for low down payment options. Uh, 3% uh, down payment is an option for conventional loans. A lot of people have a misconception that they need to put down 20% in order to get a conventional loan. I actually hear that all the time that, hey, I don't have 20% to put down. Well, you don't need 20%. There's tons of programs out there that you might actually qualify for that would allow for a low down payment. Typically the 3% down is gonna be more for a first time home buyer. They do have very good interest rates. So like when you hear on the news, average mortgage rates today are X, it's more than likely talking about a conventional product. It's not talking about all products out there. They do have what's called mortgage insurance if you do not put 20% down. And that's just a factor based on the mortgage. There's a lot of things that go into play, such as your down payment, credit score, uh, your loan to value, meaning where's your debt to income ratio. Uh, a lot of those things determine what the mortgage insurance is. The awesome thing about that is, is that once you reach to 20% down in your mortgage, then that mortgage insurance basically falls off for you. So let's just say that this mortgage insurance is $100 a month that's added to your payment, and you put down a 10% down payment, but the value in your home continues to go up. You can call up the lender and say, hey, I bought this house for $100,000. I had a $90,000 balance, but now my house is worth 120. Uh, my loan to value is below 80%. I'd like that $100 per month to come off of that. Okay. So um, very flexible. The mortgage insurance basically protects the lender uh, in case of default. Uh, it doesn't protect them 100%, but that's basically what uh, they're doing is they're taking out an insurance to say that you're going to be paying your mortgage uh, on time based on the guidelines. Current loan limits, this adjusts every single year. So you could buy up to today a $715,000 um, home, meaning mortgage size, okay? So you could actually buy a million dollar home, but you would stay in a conventional loan product if your mortgage size was 715,000. So a lot of misconception about that. We'll talk about jumbo loan products in a minute also. And then the seller contribution that Sean was talking about a minute ago, so when the consumer is actually um, putting in that offer, they could ask for the seller to pay for some of their closing costs, okay? Um, there are certain limits depending on how much money you put down on the transaction, but generally that's about three to 9%, enough to cover most or all of your closing costs depending on what you're doing. Some of the cons in regards to conventional loans is it does have a minimum credit score of 620. So we'll look at some rate examples in a, in a few minutes, but with a 620 credit score, you might be better off with a better, a different product if you have that credit score. So what you'll see is, is actually rates are based off credit score being one of the large factors. So someone that has a 720 credit score is gonna get a better rate than somebody that has a 620 credit score. Even if you're putting down 10%, there might be a different product to, to put you into. Mortgage insurance, we just talked about. And then the approval staff standards are a little bit tighter. They're looking at how you paid your mortgage history. They're looking at late payments in your credit and things of that nature. They have specific guidelines that we adhere to on all of the different loan products. Next, we're gonna jump into FHA. FHA is probably one of our most popular products out in the marketplace. Love FHA loans. First of all, FHA will technically allow you to go all the way down to a 500 credit score. However, we see most lenders cutting that off at about a 580. So what it does is it allows for credit lenders that, um, excuse me, allows for borrowers that have maybe some bumps in their credit, maybe have these lower credit scores, maybe have a few collection accounts, something of that nature. We generally go into that. Now, a lot of times people say, hey, what's a first time home buyer product? This is really more of a first time home buyer product, which again, you don't have to be a first time home buyer. But again, if you're that first time home buyer, maybe you've got less money down, maybe your credit score is not as strong, and it does allow for all that to happen. It also allows for down payment assistance, like Sean went over, and then it also allows for 6% of seller concessions. So again, let's just assume that you have a total of 5% in the bank. Well, you're gonna need three and a half percent of that for your down payment alone. 
probably that one and a half percent that you have left is not going to be enough to pay for all your closing costs that we'll look at in a little bit. So that's where you come in and, and we do that pre-approval. So we would tell your realtor, hey, Joe really needs a $5,000 seller concession in order to make this deal happen. So you're not going into negotiating a contract, not knowing that you're going to have enough cash to be able to close on that transaction. So it's super important that that's why we do all the pre-approvals up front. We know where your money's coming from. We know what you have. And it allows for us to go back to your agent that you're working with and make sure that you've got enough cash in the transaction. Some of the cons is, is that in most cases, mortgage insurance is for life on that. So it has what's called an upfront mortgage insurance premium, as well as it also has a monthly mortgage insurance premium. So if you were financing a $200,000 uh, mortgage, what you're going to see is you're going to see that the, the amount that you finance is not 200, but it might be say 204 from that standpoint, because that 1.75 is actually financed. Um, and then that, that mortgage insurance is for the life of the transaction versus with conventional, it does fall off for you. The FHA does have loan limits, however, and this is based on state and the county that you actually live in. Okay. So in y'all's Duval County, St. John's County, in that whole neighborhood, 432, 400, very similar to that 715 loan limit. These change annually towards the end of the year. So we can see that number go up a little bit. So again, if you were at a 432 loan amount, it just means that you're probably somewhere in that 450 purchase price from a standpoint of being able to go towards FHA. Then we've got USDA. I bring that up because we do have quite a bit of, of borrowers that are in the Jacksonville area that do qualify for USDA. Now, the however to that is you're driving south on 95, you're going to get off probably in St. Augustine and you're going to head west. OK, that's what you're going to see as a USDA loan. The cool thing about USDA is that it was mainly developed for rural housing. OK, however, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're in a rural area. It's how the government track these areas. And what we see is, as everybody knows about Jacksonville, Jacksonville continues to spread on how big it's actually getting right? And then how far neighborhoods are going up and things of that nature. So a lot of times we do have something that goes into to that. The cool thing is it does have a zero down payment. Okay. So, I mean, again, just like FHA, you could get into this product and set up a three and a half percent down payment. You can get into it for zero dollars down if you're willing to uh, be a little bit further out of the city limits than, than north. Again, some of the cons here, a little bit tighter guidelines. The other thing that I always like to, to mention on USDA is it also looks at everyone living in the home. So let's just say that I'm the one that's qualifying for the mortgage. However, uh, I have a wife and my dad all lives in the house. They're actually going to be asking for income for everyone that lives in the house. So that it itself could disqualify you from that scenario. This is just a quick uh, map. The yellow is a no-no area, meaning no USDA. But you can kind of see, uh, you know, down towards some of the Green Cove Springs area. And again, I always like to, you know, to reference St. Augustine. You can see St. Augustine proper is in that highlighted yellow area. But again, if you head west, that's generally going to be the area that's going to qualify you from that scenario. Other options are going to be VA. So if any of you guys are veterans or your spouses are veterans, uh, this is a incredible option um, that we have is another 0% down payment option. Interest rates generally are better on VA loans than they are on conventional. There is no mortgage insurance on a VA transaction. The seller can contribute 4% on that, and there's no loan limit. So if you're a veteran, you've served our country, or your spouse has served our country, you could buy a million dollar house and do a 0% down payment. A lot of people don't actually even know that. So a lot of times, you know, we have uh, veterans that say, hey, I want this $800,000 house. What's the lowest down payment I can get into it? And it's, it's zero. Also, it kind of allows, just like FHA, um, the debt to income's a little bit expanded. So like when we look at conventional guidelines, generally they're less than 50%. 
Sometimes with VA, we can go 55, 60%. I think Sean had one at 63. I think I read something like that. Tom. He, 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 his, his new house he's looking at is a little more expensive. I think he got up to 67. Uh, as a debt to income ratio. So amazing credit. Yeah. Amazing credit. Again, generally minimum credit scores around 620 for most investors, but again, you could go a little bit less than that if the veteran likes it. You must be a veteran in order to get this or a surviving spouse. One of the ones of the things that I run into issues with is let's just say that you're not married. Okay. You've been together for 10 years. You live together for 10 years. You act as a married couple. VA will not recognize that. You actually have to be a married couple in order to both be on a VA transaction together. Super interesting. And then VA does have a funding fee. Same scenario. VA will vary that funding fee depending on if it's your first time usage, uh, if it's your second time usage from that aspect. Quickly want to go over kind of jumbo. So jumbo are very similar to conventional loans, but they are just higher loan limits. So for example, generally they're going to require a larger down payment, but let's assume that you've got somebody that wants to buy a $2 million property. That $2 million property generally is not going to allow for a 3% down payment. Minimum down payments are generally about 10% for jumbo products. Guidelines, they just have a more narrow box that you have to fit into. Credit score, you know, generally around a 680 is what most of the, the income is from that standpoint. And then lastly, we're going to talk about non-QM. Uh, Non-QM is for somebody that doesn't fit into these uh, boxes, but they're alternative income calculations. So generally, maybe it has somebody that had a bankruptcy yesterday. It could be somebody that has a lower credit score. Most common, what we actually see is someone that maybe is self-employed. OK, so maybe they've written off too much money off their taxes. If that's the case, then what we look at is we maybe look at a no document type program, a profit and loss type program, a bank saving loan type program. But generally, if average interest rates are six percent, the race on uh, the non agency would be, you know, eight percent. And the fees are generally higher on that as well. So wanted to talk real quick about kind of comparing lenders and kind of the difference between us and if you went to, we'll just pick on Bank of America today. So Bank of America, you've been dealing with them for 20 years in your checking account. You think that, hey, because I have this checking account, I'm going to go to Bank of America. Bank of America has one set of guidelines. Okay. They have one set of products versus us as a mortgage broker. We're actually shopping rates for you on your behalf. OK, so this is just kind of a snapshot of like a lot of the lenders that we actually work with. So as you can see, the list here, the pricing kind of differences, um, we don't need to go into that. But this is what we're doing on your behalf is we're actually shopping. So, for example, if we're all doing a conventional loan, we're able to go in and see who's pricing a conventional loan best for that particular day. So sometimes some lenders might be stronger priced than an FHA loan, then they might be at a VA loan, then they might be at a conventional transaction. So this allows us to go in and shop. And sometimes it's not about rate, but it's about speed. OK, so let's just say that you go into a contract and you're saying, hey, I need to close this loan in 20 days. Well, I don't need to go to the best rate rated lender if they're always closing loans in 40 days. I need to pick a lender that I can guarantee close in 20 days. So that allows me to do that. Interest rates, what determines your rates? Outside factors, down payment, loan to value, credit score, occupancy, property type, loan purpose, lock period. So again, this is where we are the person that are looking at that to determine where your rate is and why your rate is what it is, okay? So again, hey, my aunt got a loan at 6%, why am I being offered a rate at six and a half? Well, I don't know if you noticed on the news, but we're possibly in a recession. You know, Russia and Ukraine are in war right now. Um, also, your aunt did a conventional loan and you're doing a USDA loan. It could be a lot of, of that that determines. Plus, you're buying an investment property in comparison to your aunt bought a primary residence. So again, this is what determines uh, interest rates from that standpoint. So quick example of price sheet uh, for us is when we go in to price a loan for you, 
I can offer you any rate that you want out there. Okay. So I always kind of use uh, the BMW story for that. And it, I tell people, hey, if you're going to be buying a BMW, you want to be a savvy shopper, you go into your local BMW dealership in Jacksonville, they offer you $55,000 for this three series car. Okay. You're going to be a savvy shopper. You go to Orlando. Orlando is going to be 54500 The difference is there's a pinstripe missing on the car. They're basically the same car. They're the same pricing. But then you go, well, I'm going to go online. And then if you go online, you're going to say, hey, I just got this same car offered at $35,000. I'm going to go with this car. Well, probably you're not looking at apples to apples. You're probably looking at maybe a demo. You're looking at a, a car that had an insurance claim on it or something of that nature. So that's kind of what shifts you into that perspective. So as you can see, a rate of 5% could cost you as much as $21,000 to get that rate. So if I'm quoting you and we call it par rate at 6.3%, that's not costing you any extra fees to get this. But if you were to go to a lender and they say, hey, I'm gonna offer you five and a half, you could do that, but likely there's a fee there. Now, just on the flip side, let's just say that you needed a little bit of cash to close on the transaction and you were short $2,000 on the transaction, well, maybe I just change your rate to 6.65 and I give you a credit of $2,700 and your payments change less than $50 a month. So again, those are options that we actually have as lenders that we're always gonna be working on your behalf for that. Closing costs, just wanna kind of run through this snip real quick with you. And this is an actual closing cost for a client that either I'm closing or I have closed. Kind of gives you an idea of what the, the loan amount was, the, the interest rate on this transaction. Tells me that it's an FHA loan, so they're putting three and a half percent down. It breaks down what their mortgage interest, uh, principal and interest is. Uh, also tells me what their mortgage insurance is and what their escrows are for their taxes and insurance. It tells me what their cash to close is in this transaction at $17,000. And then it also tells me that box A shows me the amount of points on the transaction. So we just looked at interest rates a minute ago. This customer wanted a little bit lower in rate, so we were able to buy that down. It also breaks down all the fees associated with the transaction, appraisal, credit report, inspection fees, it also breaks down all your title company costs, okay? And this is what we do up front. So when we're determining, if you say, hey, Jason, I've got $20,000 to, to work with, this is what we're doing is we're modeling this for you to make sure that you don't get to the day before closing and say, hey, I don't have enough you know, cash to close now. We're gonna make sure you've got enough down payment. We've gotta make sure you have enough closing costs. And if not, this is where I'm gonna get with your agent and say, hey, Joe needs an extra $5,000 pays for us his closing costs to make this transaction work, okay? Uh, so it breaks down that from that scenario. Before we wrap up, um, I'd like to get some questions if anybody has one, but I just wanted to go over kind of the common mistakes we see uh, people do when they're buying home. First, uh, especially as of late with all the online lenders out there, the difference between pre-qualified and pre-approved. So what we've gone over is the pre-approval process where we review your income documents, we review your bank statements, we review your credit report, and we truly approve you for a loan. Now, what a pre-qualification is, is you going to a website, typing in what your credit score is, uh, letting them know what you think your income is and how much money you have in the bank. They'll send you a pre-qualification letter, that you can use to put offers on houses. The problem with this is, and we've heard horror stories time and time again, is you go under contract, you think you're gonna buy the house, a week before closing, the lender reaches out and says, hey, unfortunately, you don't qualify for this home. That's the last thing we ever want to have happen to any of our clients. That's why we do all the due diligence up front. the way, other than issues that arise at the house through the inspection or the appraisal, Everything on your end as the buyer and borrower is handled well in advance. 
Uh, for self-employed borrowers, writing off too much on your tax returns uh, always comes back to bite you when you're trying to buy a house. You know, obviously we all want to pay less in taxes every year, but when it comes to buying a house, showing less income obviously isn't helpful. People opening up new debt, they think they got pre-qualified, they had their credit report ran, we're good to go. But what happens is a couple of days before closing, lenders always check up on the credit and make sure no new lines of credit are opened up. So hold off on buying the furniture until after closing. If you're thinking about buying a house in the near future, you know, going out and getting a new car payment isn't ideal either. Uh, interest rates are high on those right now. So the monthly payments high. Collection accounts are always going to have a damper on your credit report. They're hard to get rid of. The best thing you can do is try to avoid them. Fortunately, any type of medical expense uh, that arises, really the, the credit bureaus have come out and said they're not gonna be using medical debt in their uh, scoring models. We don't look at medical debt, so that's one kind of thing to keep in mind there. Again, late payments on your credit report. A 15-day late, might have only happened once, it beats down the credit score a lot. The other thing is, um, you know, a lot of people are in an industry, they've been working for somebody for a number of years, they think it's time to open up their new company. The problem with that is uh, opening up a company is risky and lenders know that. So they require a two-year history of the business. So. If you're thinking about purchasing, you want to avoid changing jobs generally. I mean, a, a horizontal switch from one place to another is always fine, but going from being an employee to self-employed is always going to add that time constraint of waiting two years. So you have two years of tax returns. You know, first year is usually low too, so it kind of pushes your goal of buying into the future. Getting a second job, a lot of people think, hey, I'm going to start Ubering. I'm going to have this extra income. It'll help me qualify for a mortgage. Again, we need to see a two-year history of that second job. So if you've had a side hustle for a number of years that you're claiming on your tax returns or it's another W-2 job, that's great. But if it's been less than two years, generally not going to be able to count that income. It's great that you have it. Extra money is always good. But when it comes to calculating your debt to income, we can't use it. Similarly, if you're going from a comfy salary job, but you got an offer to you know, make more money, but now it's going to be on the commission side, we need two years of any type of variable income. So you got great commissions this year, but you had zero last year. So we're not going to be able to use that commission income. So keeping your income stream the same for the period when you're buying is always important. Uh, another thing, when Jason went over with the closing costs, I think uh, when you first get in the home buying, you think, I'm, I'm doing a 3.5% down loan, I need 3.5%, and the closing costs aren't accounted for. They, they can add up quickly, especially in Florida. Um, you know, Property insurance isn't cheap. You're going to be paying full years of property insurance up front. Um, so they add up, you know, the state's got to get its money. Again, mattress money or cash on hand, always bad, always hard to uh, verify. And people think because on their credit report that they have a zero payment on their student loans that we don't calculate a payment, but we do. It's usually 1% or half a percent of the balance. Those are the most common mistakes people have. Does anybody have any questions? 10 on dot. Where if anybody does have any question that they didn't think of today, where can they find you? So the they, web, yeah, is a, a website, uh, Miami Mortgage Advisors. Com. And you're on uh, Instagram and TikTok and all that stuff, right? Lightly on TikTok, lightly. Okay. I haven't fully expanded. We haven't broken into the market quite yet. No, we, we have a TikTok. Looking to post a lot more on YouTube in the coming year. I think with the way shorts are going, I think YouTube is going to be something you reckon with. And right now, Instagram is a baby. But but our most viewed video is at it's on Instagram. I think it has like 4.8 million views. I think John uh, John, do you have a question? 
Yeah, what's a general um, a good income to have uh, to get a mortgage? What's it, the basic income? It, it, it really depends on price points. Um, where I grew up in Wilmington, Delaware, you could get a really nice house in a decent neighborhood for less than two hundred thousand dollars. Down here in Miami, people would dream of that. So it really depends the area you're working and living in where you want to buy what the value of homes are and then as you kind of saw in the example income is an important part but it's also expenses so i might have somebody that makes fifty thousand that qualifies for more house than somebody that makes a hundred thousand because that person with a hundred thousand has a car under his name he co-signed for a car for somebody else that's counted against them they have a lot of debt so it's hard to say you know this much money for um this house all right thank you you guys happen to know like the average selling price for a house in uh, jacksonville and maybe we can work off of that in terms of like how much income you would need in order to qualify for a house just in jacksonville for example we got income and how are we going to calculate income so for barbers we're likely going to be getting a verification of employment because of the variable hours work and the variable commissions. So that's going to look something like this. We're going to have your year to date earnings, last year's earnings and prior year earnings. So in each year we have 12 months. So we have 12 months in 2020 or 12 months in 2021 and we're towards the end of October. So I'm going to give us a full 10 here. So if we add these up, we get 34 months. So our income for a year to date is 84,000. We're going to add last year's income of 70,000 and the year prior 50,000. I'm going to add those up and that equals 204,000. So that's the total amount you made year to date the previous two years. But we don't want to see it in an annualized basis. We want to see it in a monthly basis. So we're going to take that 204,000, divide by 34, and that conveniently gets us 6,000 in income a month. But we were talking about debt to income and what that ratio can be. So typically, your usable income is 50% of your total income. So in this example, if we have $6,000 a month in income, and we're gonna times that by 50%, what we're left with is $3,000. All right, so that's our usable income. We can use that for all our external expenses, like credit cards, car payments, student loans, all that. So we're gonna start a new page. We're gonna start with usable income, $3,000. So we have non-housing expenses, and over here we're gonna have housing expenses. Trying to load something in here. Give me one second. Can you guys see that? Is it too small? Try to blow it up. So this is an example credit report. What it has is it's got the three scores up top. As you can see, none of them are exactly the same. We always use the middle. But then it also has the credit items this person has too. So this one's a little simpler. They just have a car payment and an Amex. So we have we have a $200, $293 car payment. And right here you can see a minimum credit card payment of $38. Or a grand total of $293 plus $38, $331. So as you can see, what you make is half of it but then what your expenses are, are the other half. So let's say this car payment was $600. He had $250 in credit card payments. 
and another 250 in student loans. That income gets reduced a lot, and what's left for the housing expense is a little. So we had $3,000 in usable income, and we have $331 in non-housing expenses. What's left over? $2,669. So that's what can go towards your housing expense. Copy that. Start a new one. But what goes into this? We have your mortgage payment. And when I say mortgage payment, what I really mean is the principal and interest of it. Generally, uh, people escrow their taxes and insurance. So rather than paying your tax bill once a year and your insurance bill once a year, every month you pay a portion of it in your mortgage payment. But in this instance, that's just the principal and interest. You have your property taxes, uh, property insurance, and then maybe you might have flood insurance, maybe an HOA payment. If it's a condo, there could be a special assessment. So this $2,669, let's say you have property taxes on the house you like that are 250 and for convenience sake, you got an insurance quote and that's 250 as well. So what's, what's left? for the mortgage payment. When we take the 2669, we minus 500, and what you can use towards the actual mortgage payment is 2169. So what I can do here, let's see, let's keep that in mind, 2169, I'm gonna stop sharing this. Pulling up a mortgage calculator real quick. Resharing. So some things you know offhand is generally how much money you have towards the transaction. Are you putting 3% down? Are you putting 5% down? So you enter your down payment. Interest rates, I wish, were at 4%. Let's say 6.5% these days. So right now we're, we're right around the cusp of what we needed. What was it? 2169. So could we afford a $250,000 property? Yes, we could. If we bump that up to 300, we're a little above that. So how much money do you need for a certain priced house? Um, you're probably going to need a little over six grand a month for say a $300,000 house, putting a 5% down at today's interest rates. And that and that example had a really low debt load. You know, most people have more than one credit card, car payments are creeping up, so maybe even a little more, but it, it really depends on so many outside factors that the best thing to do is just have a one-to-one, -one, get an individual answer for your individual uh, scenario, because we're all different. And I think that's all, folks. As, as one of the Looney Tune characters would say. Is that Bugs Bunny? I don't know. I forget now. Sorry, I was turning the music off. But uh, yeah, I mean, I think that was answered a lot of my questions. Michelle, did you have any questions? I guess if you want to talk a little bit about buy down, because that is more popular right now, how that kind of relates right now. Yeah. Um, that's so, thing. I mean, I, I appreciate I, that you went over a lot of the the amount that it takes because sometimes people just think I have a loan for this and then everything's covered. So that's where it's been kind of tricky with some buyers where you're like, no, you still need, you know, your down payment and stuff like that. But um, this new buy down and all these new extra things um, that are coming because of the shift. Um, there's a lot of different things going on right now. So just kind of, you know, briefly going over there. Yeah, yeah, I'd love to. So interest rates are higher than they were a year ago. Um, 
sellers are having a slowdown on the number of people coming to put in offers. So lenders, you know, they're always trying to figure out what's going to close more loans, what's going to get more people approved for a loan, um, what's going to entice people to, to purchase. So what they came out with is a buy down program. It's called a 2-1 buy down or a 1-1 buy down. And all this is, is it's a seller paid um, concession. So let's say, for example, that we do a pre-qualification, uh, you're all set and we're locking in at today's rate at six and a half percent. Well, if you negotiate a 2-1 buy down, that means on the first year, your rate's actually gonna be 2% lower. So rather than paying a mortgage on a 6.5% interest rate, the first year it's at 45 And then the second year it's at 55 And then the third year for the rest of the loan terms, it's 65 It's a pretty straightforward calculation to determine like if you're negotiating with a seller how much it's gonna be. It's dollar for dollar the difference. So we look at payments for two years at six and a half percent, and then we subtract the payments at four and a half and five and a half. And that difference is what's charged to the seller. As I'm aware, the only way to get a buy down is for it to be seller paid at the moment. Um, but that's that's up for change in the future. I wouldn't say that's set in stone, but for now. The buy downs are all seller paid, but it's a great, great way to lower your monthly payment for the coming year or two, uh, especially with the forecasts that rates should be improving. Uh, earliest estimates are first quarter, second quarter of next year. Uh, some other estimates say maybe closer to a full year out, but you know, you get in the property now, you have a low monthly payment and then you know, by the time the two one buy down runs out, it might be time to refinance into a lower rate. Uh, anyway, you know, we always say it's kind of a cliche thing we say in the industry, but it's you you date the rate and marry the house. So if you if you truly find a house that you're in love with and can't see yourself without, um, it's always a good time to buy. And if there's nothing that's suiting your fancy, you know, waiting isn't the worst thing either. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, of course. Loved it. Love to do this again. This was fun. All right. Well, I don't think I have any other questions. So I don't think if anybody doesn't have any other questions, I think we can we can end it here. All right, guys. This was wonderful. Have a great day. Jason, I appreciate it a lot.